Welcome to All24 Nightly News, coming to you live from Algiers. I'm your host, Kirin Fezakari, and up next are the top stories. Burkina Faso's military council prioritizes security and Ouagadougou and Yamasukru deny the existence of any tension in their relations. Also in our news, Algeria gains IAEA board seat, boost investment and welcomes tourism praise. Also ahead in our news, Malta and US summit ends without consensus on immigration and asylum reform. And in our Russia, Ukraine files, Zelensky forms defense alliance, Russian attacks, sparks evacuations, and Putin affirms annexation plans. Hello again, and thank you for joining our program. First off in our news, the Transitional Military Council in Burkina Faso, led by Colonel Ibrahim Traoré, is prioritizing the establishment of a secure environment for upcoming national elections. Stability across Burkina Faso is seen as essential to allow citizens to choose their new president, a key mission for the council. No, there won't be an election concentrated solely in Ouagadougou, Bougariba and a few surrounding towns. All Burkinabis must choose their president. Those who are going to apply must be able to go anywhere in Burkina for the people of Burkina. That's it. Go and campaign and all that. So we have to ensure security first. Elections are not a priority. I've made that clear. Security is the priority. The head of Burkina Faso's Transitional Military Council has affirmed that there are no tensions between Burkina Faso and Cote d'Ivoire. The statement follows media reports about the alleged involvement of two Ivorian gendarmes detained in Ouagadougou in connection with the recent coup attempt. Here's this lapsit. Ultimately, 600 kilometers of border shared by Burkina Faso and Cote d'Ivoire. However, relations between the two countries sometimes witness tensions. According to the head of the Transitional Military Council in Burkina Faso, Ibrahim Traoré, there is no problem between the Burkina and Ivorian people, despite the presence of actual differences in political visions, including the ongoing development in Niger. The current texts don't allow us to evolve calmly. In any case, what I'm telling you is that in the coming days, you'll see what the partial amendment is about. We'll touch on one aspect. There are no particular problems. I think people of the two countries are united. So, there are no problems. Policies concerning some issues could differ. We could have different stances over these issues. For his part, the Ivorian government spokesperson assured that the executive was optimistic, adding that there are no problems between the two countries. The two statements of the two top officials comes at a time when discussions are underway between Abidjan and Ouagadougou after the arrest in September of two Ivorian gendarmes in Burkina Faso territory following a thwarted coup attempt against a ruling military council and missed suspicions of the two Ivorian gendarmes involved in it, according to reports. These situations are not new. It has already happened that we've taken over Ivorian territory. Therefore, elements of our neighbors' security forces, just as it happens, but some of our elements are found in some of our neighboring countries. As for our gendarmes, discussions are underway with the Burkinabi authorities, as is usually done. And then, in general, discounts are done without problem, so we are optimistic, as long as the dialogue has not broken down. It has been one year since the coup d'etat in Burkina Faso, which received support by most of the population in the country. Then it was followed by military coup in Niger, which displayed divided stances. Burkina Faso expressed its opinion over the coup in Niger and supported the coup leaders on one hand and could have war hints for a military intervention against Niamey through ECOWAS on the other hand. This conflict in positions may result in an severe consequences against the entire Sahel region. Moving on now, Tunisia and South Africa are recommitting to African economic development, solidarity and sovereignty in upcoming bilateral talks. They aim to bolster Africa's global presence and cooperation with other African nations for peace and economic integration. They also express concerns about inconstitutional government changes and emphasize activating the free trade area for continental development. 
The two sides emphasize giving importance to the African continent, especially economic development, principles and sovereignty in Africa. To this end, the two sides agreed to enhance cooperation with the rest of the African countries to achieve the goals of peace, economic integration, and sustainable development on the continent. The two sides expressed their concern over the inconstitutional changes on the African continent and stressed the importance of activating the African continental free trade area. The two sides stressed their commitment to changing and reforming the United Nations so that it is more democratic, representative, and capable of establishing a more equitable global order. Still with regional news, the Moroccan League of Gas Station Owners, Merchants and Managers has disclosed upcoming price hikes for petroleum products, set to take effect next Monday. According to Moroccan authorities, the cost of a litre of gasoline will surge by over 50 cents. Furthermore, this adjustment will result in a record high price of 14 dirhams per litre of diesel. It's noted that oil distribution companies face substantial losses due to delayed price increases. The initiative against the occupation and the genocide of women for security and peace has strongly denounced ongoing violations against Sahrawi women by Moroccan occupation forces in occupied cities. In a statement to international human rights organizations, the initiative condemned daily abuses, including torture and imprisonment against the Sahrawi population. The organization also criticized Moroccan authorities for restricting access to the territory for media and international observers, hindering investigations into concealed violations against the Sahrawi people. In Algeria-related news, in Vienna, Algeria achieved a unanimous election during the 67th session of the General Conference of the International Atomic Energy Agency on Saturday. Algeria secured a seat on the agency's Board of Governors for the 2023-2025 term with support from the African Group of Permanent Representatives to international organizations. This appointment highlights Algeria's diplomatic successes under President Abdelmajid Taboun's leadership, marking a significant return to the international stage. It complements its previous elections as a member of the Human Rights Council and a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council. The Algerian-Uganda Trade and Investment Forum began in Kampala, Uganda on Saturday with participation from 51 Algerian institutions and numerous businessmen from both nations. The forum focuses on leveraging the African continental free trade area to enhance bilateral trade relations between Algeria and Uganda. The event aims to strengthen economic and trade ties between the two countries, commercial institutions, and establish an Algerian-Ugandan Businessmen Council. The forum also includes bilateral meetings between Algeria and Uganda, or Algerian and Ugandan business entities. Participants of the Algerian International Tourism and Travel Fair expressed appreciation for the support and resources offered by Algerian authorities in the promotion of their destinations. The event's 22nd edition provided a valuable opportunity for stakeholders in this vital sector to exchange experiences and contribute to economic diversification. Here's Zahra Fergeni with the report. 30 foreign exhibitors took part in the 22nd International Tourism and Travel Fair in Algiers, where many supporting initiatives were granted to them. Professionals active in the field of travel are seeking to introduce their tourism offers in Algeria, a land full of tourism potentials. The Algerian Authority helped us and made it easier for us this year at the borders. The procedures have become much easier and the crossings have improved, especially the quality, meaning the customer does not wait long. Both Algerian and international traders, including tourism agencies, investors and managers of hotel establishments, considered the event an opportunity to exchange experiences, establish strong partnerships with actors in the sector and promote traditional industries. The latter is indeed an important and active part of tourism that will help boost regional and international economic growth.
We want to show our culture, the culture of our Palestinian people. We want to show our support of the Palestinian people and their heritage. The Algerian people defend the Palestinian cause like us, and more than that. This was a great opportunity for us to get to know partners from the participating countries, as well as from Algeria, and it is an opportunity that we benefit from. This edition of Tourism and Travel Fair aims to encourage international actors in the field and contribute to developing tourism in Algeria with a solid ground for establishing strong interworking relations. And in our other news, on Sunday, the Algerian Civil Defense officially concluded its mission in Derna, Libya. The civil defense team, as reported on their official Facebook page, had successfully located and recovered a total of 344 deceased individuals during the course of their search and rescue operations. It's worth noting that the Libyan authorities commended and honored the Algerian team for their dedicated efforts in responding to the flood-related emergencies in Derna. Still with Libya, flights between Libya and Italy have resumed after an interruption of approximately 10 years, despite the European ban on Libyan airlines, according to sources on Saturday. An aircraft operated by the private Libyan Mediterranean Sky Company departed from Meriga Airport in Tripoli to Fiumicino Airport in Rome. As a result, Italy has become the second European nation following Malta to establish a direct air connection with Libya. This step will greatly facilitate the Libyan citizen heading to Europe and will end the interruption that has been for about 10 years, since 2014 or exactly 9 years. It was a major interruption and a complete ban of Libyan flight for entering European airspace. And in other news, on Saturday, the Italian Coast Guard successfully rescued 177 individuals, including 27 crew members, from a ferry that had caught fire en route from the Italian island of Lampedusa to Porto Impedocli in Sicily. Among the passengers were 83 migrants who had been transferred from Lampedusa. All passengers were safely transported to a Coast Guard vessel heading for Porto Impedocli except for three individuals who returned to Lampedusa. Seaplanes were deployed during the rescue operations to cool down parts of the ferry that had been damaged by the fire, which originated in the engine room that previous Friday night. During the Mediterranean European Union member states summit in Malta on Friday, a statement urging a unified approach to the migration crisis was issued. However, Italian Prime Minister Giorgio Meloni voiced concerns about the role of non-governmental organizations in addressing the issue. This comes at a time when the United Nations documented a significant number of child victims in the Mediterranean crossing. Here's Osama Yadi with the details. Leaders from nine southern European nations are demanding the EU to get its act together on migration and asylum, as yet another shipwreck tragedy unfolds off Libya's coast. These leaders met in Malta and issued a clear message. It's time to shore up efforts to stop departures from North Africa. The joint statement from the meeting insists that the EU must up its game. They want stronger surveillance of Europe's external borders to prevent people from setting sail, and they are determined to dismantle the human trafficking networks that exploit desperate migrants. Tackling these flows is a priority for governments across <coughs> our continent. As the MED9, we recognize the need for a sustained and holistic European response. The leaders are also emphasizing the need to focus on returning individuals who don't qualify for asylum, all while creating organized and legal pathways for migration. It's a balancing act that they believe is longer overdue. Uh, and at the end of the day, the need to determine on our own terms who enters the European Union, because this is about us as sovereign states, but also members of our European family exercising what is uh, a, uh, a right that we can simply not outsource to smugglers, because this is exactly what we are currently doing. It is smugglers who decide um, who gets to enter the European Union, and this must change. 
The urgency couldn't be more pressing. In fact, the EU is teetering on the edge, facing a deadline to approve a comprehensive migration and asylum reform. If they don't act soon, the whole system could unravel. To put things into perspective, under the current rules, the country where asylum seekers first land is responsible for their shelter and processing. Frontline nations like Italy have been crying foul, saying it's an unfair burden. But despite unveiling a new EU pact three years ago, progress has been painfully slow. Italy, of course, together with Malta and other first landing nations, is one of the nations that today suffers the most from strong migratory pressure. The leaders meeting in Malta are leaving no room for delay. They're calling on EU member states to ramp up negotiations and strike a deal before the legislative term expires. Still in Europe, French Prime Minister Elizabeth Bourne has successfully won a vote of no confidence in her government in the National Assembly. She employed Article 49, Paragraph 3 of the Constitution to pass the budget without a parliamentary vote. The motion of confidence garnered support from 193 deputies, falling short of the required 289 for approval. Consequently, the draft budget for the period from 2023 to 2027 will proceed for consideration in the Senate. This marked the 18th vote of no confidence faced by Bourne due to her use of this constitutional provision. Still in Europe, King Felipe VI of Spain is likely to designate outgoing Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez to form a new government as the leader of the People's Party was unable to secure the required vote for this role. However, the prospect of Sanchez continuing in power is met with significant opposition in both political and public spheres in Spain. This is largely due to the fact that his success in forming a government hinges on obtaining the support of separatist parties, which has generated controversy and resistance. Today I won't be able to give you a government, but I have given you assurance and hope. The assurance that there will be a political party that will defend the same values that the majority of the Spaniards share. Over 100,000 Armenian residents have fled the Nagorno-Karabakh region following the military operation initiated by Azerbaijan. Spokesperson for the Armenian Prime Minister disclosed this on Saturday, noting that the estimated Armenian population in the area was approximately 120,000. Artak Bulgarian, a former mediator for civil rights in Karabakh, stated on the X platform that only a small group of public sector employees, ambulance personnel, volunteers and individuals with special needs remain, and they are also prepared to leave. Until this moment, a total of 1,417 people has been displaced from Nagorno-Karabakh. 21,043 vehicles have crossed the Hakari Bridge. 81,139 people have already been registered. I would like to remind you that the government is providing free accommodation. Currently, 32,200 people have received housing. In related news, the United Nations and the government of Azerbaijan have agreed to send a mission to the Nagorno-Karabakh region over the weekend. This mission marks the UN's first access to the disputed region between Azerbaijan and Armenia in about three decades. Led by Ramash Raja Singham, Director of Coordination at the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, and Vladanka Adriva, the UN Resident Coordinator in Azerbaijan, the team's goal is to assess the situation on the ground and determine the humanitarian needs of both those still in the area and those who have been displaced. The High Commissioner for Refugees on um, the situation in the Caucasus, UNHCR, says it's deeply concerned about the rapidly increasing number of refugees fleeing into Armenia with long queues reported at the border. UNHCR tells us that people arriving are traumatized, exhausted, and hungry, and need urgent psychosocial support and emergency assistance, including warm clothes and blankets and medicine. To Russia, Ukraine file now. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky announced the formation of Defense Industries Alliance focused on domestic weapons production. 
Zelensky highlighted the significance of developing a modern defense industry as a top national priority with the aim of positioning Ukraine as leading global arms producer. He also outlined plans for collaboration with international companies to manufacture missiles, drones and artillery shells within Ukraine. We are interested in localizing production of equipment needed for our defense and each of those advanced defense systems, which are used by our soldiers, giving Ukraine the best results on the front today. Russian President Vladimir Putin declared on Saturday that residents in areas under Moscow's control in Ukraine have expressed a desire to join Russia during the recent local elections. In a video address commemorating the first anniversary of Russia's announcement of the annexation of four parts of Ukraine, Putin asserted that the option of joining Russia was strengthened by the results of the recent local elections. A year ago, a decisive, historic and fateful event happened. Agreements of four new regions of the Federation joining Russia were signed. Millions of people of Donbas, Kherson and Zaporizhia regions made their choice to be with their fatherland. This conscious, long-awaited, hard-won and truly popular decision people took together other referendums that were held in full compliance with the international regulations. Mexican Foreign Minister Alicia Barcina announced increased support for repatriating immigrants to Ecuador, Venezuela and Colombia during a joint press conference with U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken in Washington. She cited a border crisis caused by a refugee surge, leading to heightened security checks and trade disruptions between the U.S. and Mexico. Barcina underscored the social and economic factors contributing to the migration challenge. For his part, Secretary Blinken confirmed efforts to enhance coordination on immigration issues without compromising commercial interests in both countries. The risk of a government shutdown looms as the deadline to pass legislation for continued government funding approaches with Sunday, October 1st, being the critical date. The U.S. Congress is running out of time to enact new spending legislation, raising concerns about a potential government closure. Here's Sofia Kinturi. The United States is likely to have a partial shutdown soon, since House Republicans and Senate Democrats couldn't agree on funding. This indeed will cause uncertainty for things like access to national areas and most likely support for Ukraine. They can't stand up there and say they care about the military because they don't. They only care about funding Ukraine and funding that war. And then, no, then I'm listening to people in here talk about they want to kill Russians while the Mexican cartel is killing Americans. Republicans in the House who have a narrow majority can't agree on funding, bringing the U.S. close to its fourth partial shutdown in 10 years. The House can't pass a bill to keep the government running after the start of the fiscal year. We need more time to get the job done. I do not believe our troops should be punished for not getting the job done in the House and the Senate. I do not believe the Border Patrol agents should be punished. I do not believe the American public should be punished. So I want to keep government open while we finish our job to secure them. Democrats' votes are needed to maneuver through this, which upset some party members who wanted to pass a bill without their support. But what we're going to do now, because the Senate cannot act in time, government would shut down. The House is going to act so government will not shut down. It's worth noting that both chambers of Congress are at an impasse, with a small group of House Republicans opposing temporary measures to keep the government operational. Critical government services will still available, but if a shutdown occurs, most national parks will be closed from Sunday onwards. And finally in our news, Milut Stadium in Oran province is set to host an exciting fixture on Sunday evening between Algeria's USM Algiers and Morocco's a few ass robot in the 16th round of the Confederation of African Football, Al Ittihad, the reigning champion from the previous edition, enters the game as a strong contender to advance to the group stage. This is following a valuable draw it's, it's secured in Morocco. Fans are eagerly awaiting confirmation and finalization of their qualification status.
That concludes today's program. For more updates, you can always check our social media channels. Thank you for watching and goodbye.